Hello class. Welcome to NTAC 224 Connecting Networks. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. Today we're linking, looking at Chapter 5, Network Address Translation, or NAT, for IPv4. We'll take a look at NAT operation, configuring NAT, and troubleshooting NAT. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe NAT characteristics, describe the benefits and drawbacks of NAT, configure static NAT, configure dynamic NAT, configure PAT, configure port forwarding, and configure NAT64. We'll also look at some show commands to verify successful NAT operation. Keep in mind that this is somewhat of a rehash of the same or similar chapter that we had in CCNA2, Routing and Switching Essentials. So much of this material should be reviewed. NAT operation. Why do we have NAT? We have NAT because we ran out of IPv4 addresses, specifically public addresses. So NAT allows us to conserve these public addresses by using the private address space. In fact, it was NAT, or RFC 1918, that allowed private addresses to exist. Initially, there were no private addresses. Everyone had a public IP and was directly on the internet. As the addresses became more scarce, a Band-Aid approach was um, invented called NAT, Network Address Translation, where you could use and reuse these private addresses hidden within your company or home and only need one external public address for your entire organization. And all of the devices within your home would share that one public address. Essentially, you would only have, it would be like having only one phone number for your whole family. NAT must keep a translation table to keep track of which internal IPv4 address is connecting where on the public internet so that when the reply comes back, it can translate it back to the correct source. Since all source addresses internal to your network will be removed and replaced in the IPv4 packet with the router's own public IP as it exits the network to the internet. We call these two spaces the inside and outside of the network. So NAT is simply a table that keeps track of the source devices and the destinations they are communicating with so that on the return journey of those packets they can be connected back with the original source. Here would be a NAT enabled router is typically the edge router of your network. So in this diagram, router one would not be an appropriate NAT router. We usually only do NAT once we reach the edge of our company network on the way out the door to the ISP and the internet. Some NAT terminology would be inside local and inside global then outside local and outside global. These can be very confusing. PC1 would be the inside local and router 2's external address would be the inside global. So you have the global addresses on the right and the local addresses on the left. Okay. Here's a look at it here helps if we actually put the addresses in so you can see in the table at the bottom how it is moving from PC1 on out. Static NAT is a one-to-one -one mapping. This actually saves no IP addresses. It takes one internal private IP and maps it permanently and exclusively to one external public IP. The reason for a static NAT is convenience. If I have, say, a web server or some other type of server that I want to run in the, in the example shown here, maybe you want to be able to SSH into a server inside your network from your home. You would want to create a static NAT so that you could uh, type in a public IP and reach that internal server on a private IP. 
and NAT would go ahead and translate the public IP to a private. So we call this a one-to-one -one translation. We use these for our web-facing servers. Another alternative would be to create a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, which would be an external all public IP zone, and that's what a larger company would do. But for a smaller company, they may often use static NAT to um, use the public IPs that they're renting or leasing and have those statically assigned to the servers that they're running. It's one statement to set up static NAT and it will make a permanent entry in the NAT table. When you look at the translation table, it will have the private address and its associated public address permanently in that table. We move on to dynamic NAT. Dynamic NAT is the idea that you would have a pool of public addresses and they are assigned to the internal private addresses on a first come first serve basis. So if you had eight public addresses in your dynamic NAT pool, only eight internal privately addressed devices would be able to get out on the internet at one time. Once a device had concluded their conversation and was removed from the translation table, another internal private address device could then get out. This is very limiting then, it is a one-to-one -one but the addresses can be reused and reallocated dynamically. You could look at the NAT address table, the translation table, and see which addresses are in use and which ones are available. Port address, address Translation, or PAT, is the most prevalent way that NAT is utilized today. And in fact, when we say NAT, we usually assume that someone is talking about NAT overload, or what we call PAT. So NAT overload, or PAT, is Port Address Translation, and this allows a virtually unlimited number of privately addressed devices to share one public IP to reach the internet. It pulls this off by expanding the translation table to include the layer four port number. So when each internal device is sending, the translation table records its source and destination port numbers um, so that it can have multiple internal IPs sharing one external IP. So we can compare the three, right? Static NAT is a one-to-one -one translation and dynamic NAT is a pool of addresses that will allow a limited number of devices to reach the internet. And then PAT um, will allow you to use one or very few um, public IPs for all of the devices within your organization. Of course, if you want to think about speed or performance, a PAT would be the slowest because it has to record the most information. It has to look beyond the packet to the layer four segment and it does the most uh, manipulation of the fields in the packet and the um, layer four. Benefits of NAT is it conserves the public IPs. It increases the flexibility of connections to the public network in that you don't really have to worry about the public IPs. You can, uh, um, us, you can design and lay out the subnets and internal networks of your organization without any concern for how they connect up with the public networks because you've severed, really severed that connection. You've hidden your network. It also provides consistency for internal network addressing, right? You're not given a block of public IPs and you're forced to use that block and the, only those numbers you can make up your own um, internal network addressing schemes out of the private addresses. It may provide some network security. This is a very contentious point. Most experts believe there is actually no security benefit to NAT. Disadvantages, it slows down everyone's connection to the internet. It puts a burden on the router in terms of CPU and RAM and that translates into higher latency getting in and out of the network. Additionally, it breaks end-to-end -end functionality. The ends can no longer see each other. They work through one or more NAT translation tables. You lose the ability to trace um, connections across the network. It makes it difficult to do VPNs and tunneling. 
and it can disrupt initiating TCP connections because you can only call in one way. NAT allows internal devices to make connections externally, but it does not really have a good mechanism with the exception of static NAT for external devices to make internal facing connections. How do you configure it? Let's look at static, the easiest. It's one command. And then of course you have to apply it. It's a two step or two phase process. First you create the static mapping with one command, IP net inside source static, provide the inside and the outside address, boom, that's the static translation. Then you do have to specify one or more inside and outside interfaces. You need at least one of each. Analyzing your static NAT. You can see it statically in the translation table and you can see very clearly what happens to the source and destination addresses as they pass through the NAT, they switch from the private IPs to the global public IPs. You can see it here in the translations. Notice in these translations, we have no need um, for uh, uh, time to live or any, anything like that. This is a permanent static entry, so it will stay there um, forever until removed. So it shows up, if you look at NAT statistics, as a, as a static entry. Dynamic NAT. So a note on Dynamic NAT, if you're going to use it, you need to have a public IP address pool large enough to accommodate um, the number of inside devices that, that you wish to get out. One trick, if you've had NAT running for a while and you're trying to troubleshoot it, you may want to clear the IP NAT statistics so they zero out the counters um, so that you could, if you're doing a ping through your NAT, say you're pinging to the destination, even if the ping is unsuccessful and you want to verify it's actually successfully going through the NAT, you would want to clear these statistics so you could see how many hits you were having. And this is how you configure it. A little more complicated, you have to first create a pool. You provide the start and end IP addresses of the pool. You then have to create an access list that is going to define which inside privately addressed devices are eligible to access this pool. And then a third statement connects the pool with the access list. So you see the three commands, instead of one command, we need three. We create a pool, we create an eligibility list, and then we, uh, third command, connect the pool to the eligibility list. And if you're doing PAT, you add the word overload on the third command. That's the only difference between dynamic NAT and PAT, command-wise. So command-wise, they're um, established the same, except that we add the word overload on that third command shown here. Now, often with PAT, we only want to use one address in the pool, so you may alternatively only specify one address um, in that pool, or you can actually use the interfaces IP if you wish. So um, a lot of like in your home network, you would be for NAT using whatever IP address was on uh, your router externally. So then you could actually point it to the interface instead of using a pool. And again, we have to then go ahead and apply it to set, specify at least one and inside and one outside interface. Notice that in the table, we have that extra field of the port number. Here we see the colon 1444. That would be the port number. And 1445 and 80, those are the port numbers. Notice that the port numbers um, are being manipulated. They will show up in the translation table. So you can see that these are going out with upper level, what are called unrestricted ports, and then they're being translated to well-known ports on the outside and then back.
So the port numbers are being manipulated to allow NAT to keep track of each internal connection. One trick we can do is called port forwarding. This is one way that we can allow NAT to allow external devices on the internet to reach our internal devices. We can specify certain ports like port 80 or 21 or 23, whatever port we want. We can say if an, in, if an external packet arrives on the router's interface destined for that port on the router, that instead the router should run it through the NAT translation table and forward it to a specific internal device. This can allow us to run off of a single IP address we could do not only PAT, we could actually provide a web server, an SSH server, a number of different servers within our organization, all utilizing just a single public IP. Many of your home routers support this functionality, as shown here. In this case, we've given it the nickname web server, and we're saying anything arriving on this Linksys router uh, using port 80 as the destination should be translated to the IP address shown here, the private IP. So it would be arriving on the public IP and then it's going to be translated into the private IP. This is how we do it on a Cisco router. You do it just like a static. Notice that it's a single command just like for static NAT, except we are adding the addition of the port number. This would allow us to use the same IPs over and over with additional static mappings as long as the, we're using different port numbers. How about NAT for IPv6? Well, originally it was conceived that IPv6 would not need or use NAT. However, that doesn't mean that you cannot use NAT, so NAT will work with IPv6. Most commonly, we're going to use NAT when we want to interconnect IPv4 to an IPv6 network. There may be times when you want to leave your internal network IPv4 and connect to an external public IPv6 network, or vice versa. You may want to move your LAN to IPv6 now while your internet connection remains IPv4. Again, this could easily be done by using NAT64 to allow your internal IPv6 devices to be translated to an external IPv4 address. We have, of course, something called scope within IPv6, so we can have global addresses and local addresses and even link local addresses. So we can have uh, what's called site level. So you can have link local, there are non-routable addresses, um, and those start with like FE, like FE80. And then we can have the um, site local, which are routable, but they're, they're similar to a private address. They're not allowed on the public network. And then we can have global addresses that are the equivalent of a public IP and IPv4. Again, we would use NAP for IPv6 typically not as a mechanism to hide one IPv6 network from another, but primarily to allow a transition between IPv4 to IPv6. So that transition is called NAT64. And it is, as stated here, intended as a transition mechanism to help IPv4 networks bridge the gap temporarily to the newer IPv6 networks for interconnectivity. And eventually, as we all migrate to IPv6, the need for NAT64 should be diminished. You'll have a lab where you do this. It's pretty cool. Create an IPv6 only network and create IPv4 only networks and they can actually um, communicate. Troubleshooting that. Okay, well, like we mentioned, you may want to clear your NAT translations and your NAT statistics so that you zero out those counters and can really get a good look at what's happening currently. As you know, show commands uh, show you historical information that may go back quite a ways. So sometimes we like to just reset those so we get a nice clean view of what's happening currently. Worst case, we could run a debug. Now this won't work well on a production network with a lot of translations. 
if you have that, a trick is to create an access list and you can actually run a debug through an access list to help lessen um, or filter, we use it as a filter. So you could create an access list looking at just a specific IP address that you're trying to debug the translation for. In this case, we are just debugging all NAT translations. Again, on a production network, there could be hundreds or thousands of those per minute or even per second, and it would be unwieldy to manage. In the lab, however, this is a great way to get a live look at the translations as they happen. So if you turn on debug IP NAT, nothing will happen. Then you will ping from one PC on the inside to one on the outside, and all of a sudden you'll get to see the round trip translations. In summary, we talked about how NAT is used to help alleviate the expiration of or depletion of IPv4 addresses and how it conserves public address space and how NAT has um, different types, including static, dynamic, and uh, PAT overload. We talked about the benefits and disadvantages of NAT. We also covered how to configure and verify NAT. Finally, we looked at port forwarding and how that could be used to make internal devices available to the internet. We troubleshooted NAT with some show and debug. And we looked at NAT64 as a mechanism for bridging IPv4 and IPv6 networks. That's all. See you in class.